Okay, so hello everyone. Today we're having Vedant and Valeria. Uh, they'll be speaking about technical challenges for training for neural networks. Uh, if you have questions during the during the talk, if it's not a long question, uh, something really important, then you can ask. But better save it for the for the end. Okay, so to you guys. Awesome. So thanks, Leo. Um, thanks for organizing the seminar, and um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm Vedant, and I'll be giving this talk jointly with uh, my co-author Valeria. And the talk is going to be, as Leo said, on technical challenges for training fair neural networks. Uh, this is joint work with Micah, uh, John, and Tom, and uh, we have a preprint up on archive in case you want to check that out. Awesome. So uh, let's get started. Um, so as we all know. And as we've also seen in previous talks in the seminar, uh, machine learning algorithms can show discriminatory behavior. So one very famous example, uh, and that started a lot of conversation around algorithmic bias, is uh, ProPublica's audit of the Compass risk assessment tool. Uh, so for each defendant, this tool predicts the likelihood of committing a future offense. And uh, this code is used at every stage of the criminal justice process across the US. Now, controlling for all other factors and just varying race. Uh, the authors of this report found that black defendants were 77% more likely uh, to be pegged at higher risk of committing a future crime. Now, clearly, as you can imagine, uh, this kind of discrimination by the algorithm uh, can have, li uh, have life-changing consequences for the people uh, for whom the decisions are being made. Uh, in another very famous paper, uh, Jai Bulawamini and Timnit Gubru showed that commercial facial recognition systems work significantly worse for women of color. Uh, so this project has actually led to a lot of change and a lot of action by, by these corporations. Uh, most notably, IBM announced that they would no longer sell facial recognition and um, Amazon put a one-year moratorium on police use of their facial recognition software. Um, and in, an, in another application, um, this was a paper in 2013 by Professor Latanya Sweeney at Harvard, uh, where she showed that Googling for African American sounding names, such as herself, um, in this picture, um, resulted in ads such as these. And uh, most of these were links to arrest records. So, through these three very different um, applications, uh, we can see, first of all, that um, discriminatory behavior exists in uh, data driven algorithms. And additionally, uh, such behavior can lead to actual harm. Uh, people can have like life-changing consequences as a result of these uh, discriminatory behaviors by machine learning models. Uh, so issues such as these have uh, led to a lot of work uh, and a lot of it from a technical standpoint uh, in the machine learning community and also in other CS fields on mitigating such behaviors. So I just put a screenshot of some early papers that uh, propose solutions to mitigate unfair behavior in ML models. And um, so these were just some of the first few papers in this space and since then there have been many works that, um, that, improve, these, uh, that improve these results. Uh, but broadly, uh, these approaches can be put into uh, three, the following three buckets. Uh, the first one being pre-processing, where uh, the goal of this, these kinds of methods is to apply certain transforms to a given data set such that any downstream algorithm trained on this data set uh, does not result in unfair behavior for, for some definition of unfair behavior. Uh, the second um, bucket, uh, which we call this in processing, uh, aims to change the learning process. Um, often we are altering the objective function to achieve downstream fairness. And the third one, uh, post-processing, um, these, these methods include uh, fairness-aware calibration of, of output scores. So in this work, we'll focus on just the in-processing methods. So just to give you a little bit of background on how these work. So uh, the key idea behind almost all methods in, the, in this in-processing bucket, uh, and in fact, for any fairness method is that uh, one must formalize what they mean by fairness. Uh, now, as you can imagine, this is a very subjective task and that makes it a very challenging task as well. So for example, I took this screenshot from the FairML book and um, it shows all the different kinds of demographic fairness criteria that it existed two years ago when the book was published. Um, and this isn't even the complete list. Uh, so first we must choose a fairness definition. Uh, 
maybe one of these definitions and then precisely mathematically define it. Uh, once we do that, we then change the traditional supervised learning, um, the traditional supervised training algorithm, which looks something like this. Uh, we change it to instead look something like this. So we minimize the uh, total loss, which we usually do, but we add, a, um, but we add certain constraints, uh, which in this case would be some formalism, some formalism of fairness. Uh, now, many prior works have done this and have shown that this can actually be effective in reducing up, uh, downstream unfairness. But all of these prior works actually analyze classical machine learning models like SVMs and logistic regression. And uh, only very recently have people started looking at very shallow neural networks. So in this work, uh, the question that we try to answer is that how do the existing in processing fairness interventions work for deep neural networks? And uh, just as a scholar, it don't work so well. Um, so now one question could be, why do we want to look at deep neural networks when people have already looked at classical methods and they've shown that it works? Why do we want to create more problems by looking at deep neural nets? So there are many applications where DNNs massively outperform traditional machine learning models. And uh, a lot of these applications are actually image classification applications. Uh, so for example, patient recognition and medical image classification. Uh, these are two applications of, of deep neural nets um, where they outperform machine learning models massively. And also people have shown fairness concerns in these applications, uh, patient recognition not working for certain sets of people, uh, medical image classification being worse for certain demographics. And secondly, from a technical standpoint, uh, deep neural networks operate in the over-parameterized regime. So this means that the number of parameters that we're trying to learn is much, much larger than the number of training points we have. Um, and in this setting, as, as you can imagine, overfitting is very easy. And um, the decision boundary that you ultimately learn is a very fluid decision boundary. So do these um, extra challenges that come in because of uh, over-parameterization, how do these challenges affect uh, fairness interventions? And that's something we wanted to study in this work. So just a brief overview for the rest of the talk. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the experiment setup, experimental setup and give you a little bit of the background and the fairness constraints we use. And then I'll hand it over to Valeria to discuss uh, some of the results we have um, for, for all these fairness, uh, fairness methods. So we use, like I said earlier, we use two different applications. The first one being patient recognition. Uh, for this, we use the widely used CelebGate dataset. Um, so this has about 185,000 images from um, 9,000 identities. And additionally, it has labels for sex and age. Um, and typically models on this data set tend to be more accurate than males and females. So that, that brings in a fairness concern. Um, and the second uh, application where we, uh, where we analyze um, uh, fairness constraints is uh, medical image classification. Uh, for this, we use Chexpert, uh, which is a widely used chest X-ray data set. Um, and it has about 200,000 images and it has labels for various pathologies. Uh, so the task here is for a given image, we want to predict if a given pathology is present in that, in that X-ray or not. And uh, for, for, um, for facial recognition, we measure accuracy and for, for uh, medical image classification task, we uh, measure area under the curve for the rock curve. So a little bit about the uh, uh, different fairness methods we try. Uh, so the first uh, set of things we try are fairness regularizers, wherein we add a regularization term to the traditional um, uh, loss minimization objective. Um, so we tried three different regularizers. One is the equal loss. Uh, Valeria is gonna talk more about this, but very quickly this uh, forces the net network to have equal losses for different demographic groups. Um, the second one is the equal odds uh, regularizer. Uh, this aims to equalize the true positive and false positive rates across groups. And the third one is the disparate impact regularizer, uh, which aims to equalize um, the positive rates across groups. Uh, the second thing we consider is the min-max loss, uh, which is often referred to as Ralstein loss in some papers. Mm -hmm. So the goal here is to uh, minimize the loss for the sensitive group, which has maximum loss at, at, at a given iteration. So at a given iteration, you look at your training set and you see the group that's doing the worst and you try to make it better for that group. 
uh, we also try random label flipping. Uh, so this acts as a good baseline uh, for our method. So what, what random label flipping, what we're doing in random label flipping is that um, we take the subgroup which has superior accuracy during training and we just randomly flip the output labels for a certain fraction of that training data. So for example, you, uh, if males in your training data had higher accuracy at a given integration, you would just flip some, um, you would flip the output label for some of these uh, training samples. So this provides us a good baseline to understand uh, if we can achieve fairness or not. And the last, uh, the next two are specific to facial recognition. Uh, so the first one is adjusted angular margins where we uh, use different angular margins during training. Uh, therefore, the hope is to promote uh, Better, better feature learning for both, uh, for different demographic groups. And the final one is uh, fair feature representations. This is also uh, specifically for facial recognition, um, where the goal is to learn representations that are not correlated with sensitive attributes. Um, and the intuition where you want to do this is that if we, if we, if our algorithm is um, blind to certain sensitive attributes, then it cannot discriminate against the sensitive attributes. Uh, but Valeria is going to talk about some issues with this uh, with this scheme as well. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Valeria. Hi, um, I'm Valeria. Can you hear me well? Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'll continue this presentation. Um, so the first thing that we've tried to mitigate unfairness in facial recognition task and uh, medical image classification task is um, fairness constraints. So we tried three as uh, equal loss, equal odds, and uh, disparate impact constraints. Uh, but only one of them we tried for both tasks because uh, facial recognition is a multi-class classification task. So we only tried, so only equal loss constraint would, would make sense for both tasks. Um, okay, next. Thanks. Um, so equal loss uh, constraint, the idea of equal loss constraint is that we want to get um, equal accuracies of the model across sensitive subgroups at test time. And so to achieve that, we could maybe try to uh, get equal uh, losses across subgroups um, at test time and hope that this will lead us to equal accuracies as well. And to enforce, um, equal losses uh, across uh, sensitive subgroups, we could add this equal loss penalty to our training objective. So instead of just minimizing the um, loss for the primary task, so for the, for the uh, facial recognition task or medical image classification task, we also add this penalty, uh, which is a mm, uh, absolute mm, value of the difference between losses uh, for uh, subgroup A, which is the minority group, and subgroup B, which is the majority group. So for example, uh, in case of facial recognition, that would be laws for males minus laws for females. Uh, next. Um, and the results that we get is that uh, on check spirit uh, with these constraints, with these penalties, uh, model just overfits to training data. And so it has perfect performance at train time, which leads to uh, fairness penalty being close to zero when it's imposed on training data. But at the test time, the model is still unfair. So the model is perfectly fair at train time, but still unfair at test time. So that is a problem of overfitting to training data. Uh, for facial recognition, it's a slightly different problem. So in facial recognition slab A, uh, the model overfitted on fairness penalty to training data. So it did not get perfect accuracy on, uh, on training data, but it, get, it got uh, perfect fairness on training data. So fairness penalty was close to zero at train time, but the model was still unfair at test time. So in both cases for Shakespeare and Celeb A, we have uh, problems of overfitting, but slightly different problems. Uh, in, in the first case, uh, we just overfitted to training data, and that is why we had a penalty close to zero at train time. But in the second case, uh, we overfitted on fairness penalty to training data. Um, okay, next. Uh, next. Uh, so then we thought 
of this idea, if we overfit to training data, can we use a holdout set to impose fairness constraints? Uh, next. Uh, so we created a holdout set uh, and we computed the loss um, for primary task on training set, but we computed uh, penalty on the holdout set. And as a result on celeb A, the model just overfitted on fairness objective to holdout data. So we had perfect fairness on holdout data, but still no fairness in test data. And for Chexpert, uh, we didn't even get uh, equality of accuracies on holdout set. So it even deteriorated um, fairness on holdout set. So it also didn't work. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so the next idea that we've tried is um, random label flipping, which is a very simple idea. Um, next. Um, so the idea is uh, just randomly flip labels in the training data for the images uh, from the subgroup with superior accuracy. So for example, for facial recognition, uh, the models were more accurate on males. And so we flipped labels for some of the uh, male images to other male identities. So in this case, we hope that uh, we would degrade performance of the superior uh, superior subgroup slightly uh, without degrading performance uh, on the minority class. That is the idea. Uh, next. And the results that we get is that actually this simple method improves fairness on test set for facial recognition tasks. So uh, in the baseline on test set, we've got 93% accuracy on males and 88.6% accuracy on females. So the gap was 4.6% um, accuracy gap. And when we train a model uh, with random label flipping, uh, this gap reduced to 1.3%. And what is, what is really surprising is that it didn't degrade female performance at all. Uh, it even increased it slightly to 88.7%. So it just, decre just degrades uh, the male performance. Uh, the problem is that on Chexpert, on medical image classification, this approach didn't work. And in fact, we just observed very unstable trends in uh, area under the curve disparities. Um, okay, next. Um, and the next approach that we've tried for uh, facial recognition task was uh, adjusted angle margins. Uh, this idea was described in this uh, paper by Mei Wong and Wehong Teng. Um, it was, uh, so in this paper, it was used for mitigating uh, racial bias in facial recognition, facial verification task that comes from unbalanced data. Uh, in our data set in Celeb A, uh, data is more or less balanced with more female images than male images. So our unfairness, unfairness in our models does not come from unbalanced data probably, uh, but yes, it comes from, some, from somewhere else. Uh, okay, next. Okay, some background. Um, so facial recognition systems uh, need to distinguish between thousands or hundreds of thousands of classes, right? Because we have many identities. And so those systems should, should be able to distinguish between uh, many, many classes. And um, to achieve that, facial recognition losses are designed to increase the angular separation between classes using some angular margins. Uh, and also, I think it's, uh, we need to mention that um, at train time, uh, facial recognition systems are trained in a classification manner. But at test time, uh, those systems, systems should recognize um, images of people it has never seen during train time. So if, um, if a model was trained on images of celebrities, then at test time, it should still be able to recognize images of me, for example. And those systems uh, have access to a database with lots of images with known identities. So for example, those images might be passport photos or uh, images from social media profiles. 
So um, yeah, so those databases consist of um, I don't know, millions of images with known identities. And then when this model gets a new probe image whose um, identity it needs to recognize, it extracts features from this image and it compares features with features of images in the database. And then uh, the closest matches uh, in the database are used to reveal the identity of a person on probe image. So for example, if uh, the system has an image of me from my Facebook profile in the database, and then it is given uh, my photo, I don't know, from the, from the surveillance camera, for example, then it extracts um, features from this photo uh, and compares those features to images, to features of images in the database and finds that the closest image in the database is actually my photo on Facebook. So that's how those systems work at test time. Okay, next. The idea of this approach is to use uh, different angular margins across groups during training. And in this case, we would hope that this would promote better feature discrimination for minority class. So for example, if we use um, higher angular margin for females, then we would hope to get uh, better feature discrimination for females um, in the angular space. Okay, next. Uh, as a result, this approach actually improves fairness on validation set. The problem is that the validation set consists of images from the same identities as the training set. So that means that, um, and it, it, so in fairness does not generalize to test sets. So uh, the model does not become more freer uh, on images of identities it has not seen during training time. And that means that we basically overfit on fairness objective to training identities, but now not images. So we still fear on new images of training identities, but we are not fear on uh, images um, of test identities. Um, yes, yeah, so that was the problem with this approach, still uh, doesn't work. And the last approach that we've tried is uh, fear feature representations. Uh, so fair feature representations is one, I think, of the most common approaches tried uh, in neural networks. The idea is to learn embeddings such that they are independent of sensitive attributes. And if we would hope that if embeddings do not contain any information about the sensitive attributes, then classifiers built on top of those embeddings would also be fair. Yeah, so the idea is that can we learn fair representations that do not contain uh, sensitive information, in our, in our case, information about gender. Uh, so uh, to test this approach, we took a particular method described in Sensitive Nets paper because it was uh, designed uh, particularly for a uh, facial recognition task. In their case, they use it for face verification. Um, and the approach that they use is to train embeddings such that they minimize the facial recognition loss, but simultaneously maximize the probability of predicting a fixed gender G class for all images. So we have um, a model, a, classi a classification model that classifies, uh, that predicts gender from embeddings. And we want to train embeddings such that um, Gender, uh, gender classification model would predict a fixed gender for all the images, right? So we simultaneously uh, train this gender classification model and we simultaneously train uh, those embeddings. So we want to get embeddings such that they are good for facial recognition task, but they, they are bad uh, for a gender prediction task. And we would hope that if we can predict gender from those fair feature representations, then uh, a facial recognition model would become more fair with respect to gender. Okay, next. But uh, what we find is that this method just deteriorates performance on gender that is used in adversarial penalty. In particular, that is the gender, the opposite gender of G. 
So if at training time we want um, a gender classification model to predict all images, to label all Im Im images as uh, males, that means that we would hurt uh, embeddings of um, female images, right? And so we would just uh, deteriorate performance on female images and vi vice versa. So if we want to predict a fixed gender G females, so we want to classify all the images as female images, uh, that means that we um, change embeddings of uh, male images. And so that would, that would degrade performance on male images. Uh, so that was the problem with this uh, sensitive nets uh, approach for facial recognition task. And the last problem that we investigate is fairness gerrymandering. Uh, next. Uh, so fairness gerrymandering is a problem with those fairness methods um, when a model might become more fair to one group at the expense of other groups. So for example, uh, if we enforce constraint on uh, with respect to gender, uh, the model might become fair with respect to gender, but at the same time, it might become less fair with respect to another sensitive attribute such as race, for example. Uh, next. And that is a simple illustration of how that happens. So in this case, we have uh, points are samples and uh, red line is a decision boundary. And we have a binary classification task where color denotes label and shape is the first sensitive attribute and outline uh, is the second sensitive attribute. And you can see that if we want to enforce fairness with respect to uh, shape, in this case, uh, then fair model on the right uh, becomes more fair with respect to shape compared to the baseline model on the left. But at the same time, it becomes much less fair with respect to the se second sensitive attribute, which is outline, right? You can see that uh, it is fair with respect to uh, triangles and circles, but it misclassifies both uh, elements with solid boundary. Uh, and actually, fairness gerrymandering was found in linear models, but we expect that in deep neural networks, this problem is even uh, is even worse uh, because uh, in deep neural networks, we have this fluid boundary that can create some uh, complex, uh, yeah, that can can, that can um, lead to very complex biases. Um, next. And from our experiments, we actually observed uh, fairness gerrymandering. So um, in Chexpert, uh, one of the models that, would, that was actually uh, more fair with respect to gender than the baseline model appears to be um, less fair with respect to age compared to uh, the baseline model. You can see that on this plot, um, baseline is the blue line and on the x-axis we have age beans and on the y-axis we have area under the curve and orange line denotes uh, the model trained with equal uh, loss penalty that is more fair with respect to gender but in this case it becomes less fair with respect to age and in facial recognition task we test fairness gerrymandering on an external data set. So we took a data set containing labels for races. We have four races, it's African, Asian, Caucasian, and Indian. And the baseline model that we have is much more accurate uh, on Indians than it is on Asians. But we found that the model trained with adjusted angle margins is actually even more unfair with respect to race. Right? So it might be more fair with respect to gender, but it's even more unfair with respect to race. Uh, surprisingly, uh, the model trained with random label flipping becomes more fair with respect to race. And actually it is more accurate on this data set for some reason. Uh, you can see that the accuracy on India's go Indians goes down a little bit, but the accuracy on Asians goes up a little bit. So this model becomes more accurate and uh, more fair with respect to uh, race. 
Okay, so that was uh, for a fairly legitimate rate. And yes, that's the end of our presentations. Thank you. Uh, so conclusions is that we empirically tested a range of um, existing methods for imposing fairness during training of deep neural nets. And we found that most methods actually fail in over-parameterized regime for multiple reasons. And, uh, fair, and overfitting is one of those reasons. Uh, and also we observed that fairness during the uh, problem of achieving fairness at the expense of at the, at the expense of other sensitive subgroups uh, can be very problematic for DNNs uh, because of the flexible and very fluid decision boundaries that those model, models um, get. Yeah, uh, we would love to hear your feedback. Uh, we, have, we have this paper on archive and yeah, please ask us questions and email us. Thank you, both of you. Uh, that was great. Uh, let me do the clapping reaction. Uh, uh, okay, people, we have plenty of time for questions. So feel free to un unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Was it too fast? Do we maybe need to clarify some some moments about our experiments or something else? I wouldn't just send you the type of question. Any questions? Just pointing out there are Thank some in the chat. Yeah. So I can I can take Eric's question, which talks about which asks what is some future work uh, for the topic of fairness with DNNs. And um, I think our results point to plenty of avenue for future work because um, so we know that in the over parameterized regime, um, our models, even though they, they have a tendency to work with the training set, they still perform very well on the test set. So this generalization does happen for uh, metrics like accuracy, but somehow uh, this 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 becomes much more of a problem for fairness. So I think one one issue is how do we um, take what we're getting with accuracy, which is this good generalization property, and um, sort of transfer that to uh, metrics like fairness as well. Um, and I think uh, another issue we saw in our thing was that um, these constraints end up uh, be not being very good proxies. So they end up giving you very good uh, fairness performance and training set, which does not generalize. Uh, so another, uh, which another interesting future work could be to have uh, better surrogates for these fairness constraints, which you can then um, apply off the shelf to deep neural networks and um, get generalizable fairness. Um, yeah, I Okay, Aravind asks, uh, in fairness gerrymandering, can you not add one constraint for each group? Yes, you can add, uh, for example, constraints for groups that uh, you have labels for, like, uh, for example, age, gender, race, or something else. But at the end of the day, your model might become unfair with respect to hair color or um, um, yeah, hair length or something else. So uh, because of the very flexible and fluid boundaries of the DNNs, uh, you might uh, have uh, biases which are very difficult to detect and you just don't have labels for to for those attributes to um, to enforce more fairness constraints.
right? So our inspection is, is it too expensive to have a human in the loop doing repeated legal feedback to the issue of unfairness uh, with respect to unforeseen parameters, right? But the, the, data, the data set consists of like millions of images. How would you, it was actually very difficult to look at those images and try to detect biases just by eyeballing. So I think that uh, it is actually not possible to detect all those complex biases in so many uh, images in the training set. So, the question is, can you say something more about what you expect with work? Can you combine these approaches like the representations and fairness constraints? Yeah, my first point. Yeah, we did not try combining them uh, right now. Uh, but I think one thing which is pretty clear won't work is that um, any sort of surrogate which gives you which um, shows perfect fairness on an overfitted training set, uh, those kinds of surrogates won't work. Um, and I think one more thing that our results point to is that um, like in processing techniques are not the only set of techniques, right? You also have post, post hoc rebiasing, but you also have uh, pre-processing and, and stuff like that. Um, so I think one thing we, which our results sort, sort of point at is that uh, we should probably be paying more attention to these other two buckets, which we did not pay attention to yet. Um, and in terms of what could work in processing, I think uh, what you suggested could be a promising thing to try, but uh, we did not try that. But I don't know if Valeria wants to answer that. Yeah, I'm a little bit skeptical about, um, at least about fair representations approach in case of facial recognition. What else? It might be a good. Um, it might be a good approach where, for other tasks, but for example, for some tasks where you have uh, different positive rates across sensitive groups. For example, maybe for males in a binary classification task, for males you have more um, positive outcomes than in a female group. Uh, this approach would fail because. Um, because if, um, yes, so if you get uh, embeddings uh, completely independent of sensitive attribute, then you would not be able to uh, build a classifier on top of them such that it, um, it produces a positive, rate, a positive uh, outcomes at different rates for those subgroups. And that might be a problem uh, in cases in tasks where you have equal rates uh, of positive outcomes across subgroups, that might be working. Yes, 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 yes. I think that uh, maybe a combination of uh, pre-processing, in-processing and post-processing might be, uh, might work for some tasks. 
Uh, again, uh, we are not sure how to overcome this problem of fairness gerrymandering, especially in deep neural networks. Um, Uh, how was the accuracy determined? Was the model evaluated multiple times? Um, do you mean for uh, facial uh, for facial recognition? I'm not sure I understand the question about evaluated multiple times. Uh, we've tried it uh, with a few models, uh, but we did test them on the same test data. Uh, no, we did not use k-fold cross-validation. Uh, did, did, did you use it for Chatsburg? No? Yeah. no. So, yeah, we just picked the top performing models for these tasks because many people have already studied these tasks um, extensively in prior works. So we just took like whatever state-of-the-art um, model was publicly available. Yeah, at least we didn't see in the literature people would use k-fold cross-validation for facial recognition and experts, so we just decided to do a test set.
seems like there aren't any more questions. So thank you again, Vedant and Valeria. It was a great talk. Uh, and uh, we were happy to have you here today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.